welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm your host, Paula Morance Cohn, and today our guest is Joan Dijon, Trustee Professor of Romance Languages at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Dijon is the author of numerous books on French literature, history, and culture. Her most recent book is something of a departure from her previous, more scholarly works. It's entitled The Essence of Style, How the French Invented High Fashion, Fine Food, Chic Cafes, Style, Sophistication, and Glamour. Joan Dijon, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you for having me. Um, well, we do associate so much that's fashionable and luxurious with France, but we don't necessarily know why. And you trace this to the mid-17th to early 18th century, the reign of Louis XIV and his court. And I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about Louis XIV, the Sun King, and his court that caused this, this burgeoning of style to happen. I think he was a combination of style and business, and that's mm. why it happened. He was, to begin with, an incredibly stylish man. He had cared all his life. He loved uh, to dress, and kings had to dress, uh -huh. but he clearly loved it and everything. He was always planning outfits from the time he was very young all through his, all through his life. Yeah. But he also cared very much about France and about making luxury profitable for France. And he worked very hard with the man who was his minister of finances, Colbert, to make this happen. And whenever he would start spending too much, Colbert would stop him and then fi figure out some way to make whatever industry he was supporting from a foreign country French to, to have a takeover for France. Okay, that's interesting. I guess I think of Princess Diana when you say that. So he was very aware that although he loved style himself, that it could be an industry for France. Absolutely. Everything, I mean, this is one of the most, these are some of the most expensive things one can buy in the world at that point. A gorgeous outfit was phenomenally expensive, beautiful mirrors, everything he was dealing with would be, could be very expensive, and all over Europe, people were buying more and more from all this. So the money was going to go to some country, and France became the country that largely capitalized on everything. Okay, well, I do want to talk with you about some of these items, but before doing so, I wonder if there was something before Louis XIV in the French culture, in the French psyche, that made it fertile ground for the mm -hmm. development of, I guess, aesthetics, taste, style. Well, France has a long tradition, I mean, both of art, of culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there were certainly beautiful people beautifully dressed in France. But France wasn't known as the style capital of Europe. Uh, Venice would have been the likely place people would have oh. thought of in the late 16th century. Uh, and so the fact that Venice sort of fell apart at that point was useful for the French okay. because they lost a competitor. But certainly everyone said that Venetian women were the most beautiful women in Europe, the most stylish women. And the banquets and the court festivities that were thought of as the most glorious were associated with Italy, not France, before the period began. Okay, okay. So that's interesting. And he took advantage, Louis XIV, of the fact that the Venetians were no longer the premier. As powerful, as yes. Powerful. And also, he, this was someone who was determined. Uh, he's, he, we have his memoirs, mm -hmm. and they're quite wonderful. It's clearly a king who was determined to make France uh, something, and to be remembered as the king who had transformed France. Mm -hmm. So there was a nationalist element. Oh, there. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the elements that are so associated with France. I guess we'll start with fashion, mm -hmm. couture, haute couture. Um, I notice in your book you have an illustration of a winter outfit, an habit d'hiver, mm -hmm. um, which I guess was popularized. The notion of a seasonal outfit or an outfit for an occasion, mm -hmm. was this very much popularized during this period? Yes. Yeah. So it's almost the foundation of the fashion industry. Uh -huh. This clothing was, was so expensive that people didn't change. There was not the notion we have today of, getting, of changing new things, new elements, mm -hmm. new seasons. And the idea of a fashion season is simple but totally brilliant. Because yeah. then you're telling people, oh, well, as they did, this yeah. one newspaper. But we don't know where the idea came from. Probably a combination of fashion merchants and the editor of this newspaper in 1678 to proclaim that now they're seasons. And to say to people things like, oh, you wore gray last year, but not the same gray as this uh -huh. year. That was mouse gray. This is pearl gray. So don't even think of appearing in last year's gray. It's, it's over. And that kind of idea is, is just a brilliant marketing tool because brilliant you can marketing. tell people yeah. you know, to change things and recognize and have a newspaper showing this winter outfit, winter 1678, the first fashion season mm. uh, ever. And what uh, were the items that made up the winter outfit? Well, they, and what, the other wonderful thing, and I think that yeah. all now fashion magazines do this, and Fashion right. Illustration didn't do it for centuries, though, goes through with little arrows showing the things, right. fur trim here, velvet here, a muff 
just this kind of muff, all kinds mm -hmm. of gorgeous things, obviously very expensive, and the kinds of things that the, would, would keep the fashion industry in France going for centuries. And to be changed each season, so of course you had to buy more. Exactly, to buy more, today. and also largely to base the outfits on the things that are most easily changed and most profitable to merchants, the accessories. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, the accessories would be things that the no, uh, people who weren't necessarily of the nobility could also buy. Oh, so sure. It would, it would Certainly a cheaper down. model. Yeah. So eventually you have a trickle down. Mm -hmm. 1678 was also a great moment in women's fashion, and in men's fashion as well, when they started making a new type of outfit. It was a cut. Actually, this is uh, it's an accidental thing. This could be seen as a, <laughs> yeah. as a mantra. It's a sort of a coat for indoor wear, except it wasn't fitted like this. It was a sort of kimono-like cut, mm -hmm. so that they didn't have to be fitted in the same way as before. Women still wore stays, but they were worn underneath this looser outer garment, and those could be done ready to wear. Oh, so, so they were already ready to wear. Well, mm -hmm. the, the men, most w women of the court had the maid, had uh, the uh -huh. maid for themselves, but you could also have them, because it's a kimono-like cut, it's a very easy cut, uh -huh. so that they, we know that there were cheaper models made. And soon people, are, are sh ladies' maids in France are beautifully dressed, just like the women they serve. So there are all kinds of letters from foreign visitors near the end of the century saying, it's so incredible. You go into a store in France, and the shop girls, because they, we learned that men sold in shops elsewhere in France, mm -hmm. they put beautiful women. They were saying that it's a great marketing idea because they're very pretty and they attract you in. And they said they were better dressed than fine women in our countries. Ah. So it, it's clear that fashion is becoming is spreading more and more. So the shop girl was another innovation in a sense. Exactly. That was an accoutrement of fashion. Exactly. And huh. dressing beautifully and as in the shop that you work in. Uh, as people try still to do today, became part of that Part too. of the marketing mm -hmm. business. Yeah. Um, other accessories, shoes, for example. You yourself said that you're a shoe person, as I am. And shoes, I guess, became particularly popular. You have a picture of a fancy mule. Yes, beautiful, uh, beautiful shoe. shoe. For all kinds of reasons. Yes. It's the first time that high heels are worn for women's shoes, are made. Um, before that, there were various kinds of platforms that raised women's height, but no heels were done. And this is an era of high heels, even from the images, very high heels. The late 17th and early 18th century are times, hmm. the first spike heels. Now, I, men also wore heels. Men wore they? heels, yeah. th not thin heels, so they had the advantage of something more yeah. comfortable, but relatively high heels. And Louis XIV is someone who popularized something that had existed before in other countries, but hadn't been used so much, bright red heels for men's shoes. Um, this continued all through the end until the French Revolution to be a, st a status symbol in France. They were a signal of the nobility. People, bright red Bright heel. red heels. And he did just all kinds, the heel. Just the heel of the ah. shoe, but then they did all kinds of matching elements. Mm. There were ties, bright red, large ties often, and under them was sort of a flap at the front of the shoe mm -hmm. that could be turned over, and that was bright red as well. And lines. So there were a lot and of red accents on the shoes. Only the nobility were supposed in to France, wear. exactly. Yes, yeah. In England, people wore them to signify. Men wore them to signify that they loved French style. Okay. So they took on they took on different meanings all over Europe. But they were huge, huge fad. That's fascinating. And beautiful shoes. Yeah, I mean, well-made shoes. Be oh, just gorgeous shoes. Louis the Fourteenth had some beautiful shoes. It was a famous. Sh the first shoemaker whose story we know we know was a shoemaker to Louis the Fourteenth. Do we have any of those shoes preserved? Is there a museum I, of Louis XIV? There, no. Uh, it's, there are yeah. not many shoes before very late in the 17th mm -hmm. century, and no, one, no famous shoes. I swore at some point I was positive I had seen an image of a shoe that had belonged to Louis XIV, and I couldn't remember where. I turned over. I drove people crazy in collections. I wanted this photo again, and I never could find it. So you I may have dreamed it. <laughs> is was okay. one of my conclusions. I, perhaps you have this quest that you're going to find a pair of Louis XIV. Well, I doubt if it will come to me, market. but I don't no. think that's going to come. Okay. But maybe somewhere in a museum, someone will someday turn show me an image. OK. Um, makeup and jewelry also uh, pioneered, in mm -hmm. a sense, during this period. Yeah. Makeup fascinates me, because for uh, certainly, I guess, in other parts of Europe, it was considered not appropriate for Absolutely. women to wear makeup, but it was in France or among, yeah. among the nobility? There, there are critiques of makeup in France, but very, very, very slight. Protestant countries had a real problem with women wearing makeup, mm -hmm. and famous uh, English visitors to France were always commenting on this and saying they were too heavily made up. But French women loved makeup, used it for all kinds of reasons, from the obvious ones like hiding scars from smallpox mm -hmm. that people talk about, 
to doing things like painting blue uh, highlights on some of the veins, which some people think is an origin of the expression blue blood, um, oh. to do you know, all kinds of elaborate things. What about the beauty marks? Oh, beauty marks they loved. Because uh, you think of that, the yes. patches, that's patches. it, on uh, the cheek or on the chin. They were up to, in many of the fashion illustrations, uh, mm -hmm. including some of the ones in, the, in my book, if you look at them closely, they wore not one or two, up to a dozen. And these, you could have... I mean, grotesque. They, you know, to yeah. us, they seem, yeah. they're one of the fashions, but every period has extreme mm -hmm. fashions that later seem grotesque. It could have been to hide scars, because that's one of the functions right. of them. Right. They claimed that the function was to show off the whiteness of your skin, the contrast with the black beauty mark. But those were heavily used and favored. Uh, the compact, mm -hmm. that was developed during that period? Well, a mirror, a small, the a idea small of a pocket mirror. mirror. So mirror. So Mirrors were all the rage. Exactly. And because it's a new fashion, People didn't mind. They indeed they celebrated showing, looking at their little small mirrors when mm -hmm. they're in public because it's a new thing. It's a hot new craze. Some of them were, became part of outfits. They were hung on elaborate yeah. chains from your belt so that you wore them as a fashion yes. accessory. Well, the other thing uh, I guess, and that we still associate, I think, with France is hair styling. Um, I still believe that the only place you can get a really good haircut is in France. Well, every French hairdresser would like you to believe that still. <laughs> and I do think that they're There's wonderful. There's some truth in it. There is some truth. I, believe, I uh, think they're wonderful hairdressers in France. There's uh, so a long the, tradition of it, certainly. The invention of the coiffure, which is the hairdo, and the coiffeur, which is the hair stylist, mm -hmm. and the stylist taking on a great importance in the culture as an artist, right, really. Exactly. Was that the case at the yes. time? The first hairstylist whose name we have and whose story we know, he was so famous that we have plays about him, short stories about him, newspaper articles about him. I mean, this is a lot of coverage for a period. And the word hairstylist, coiffeur, was created to refer to him. The first use we have appearance of the word is in the title of the play based on him. So he is certainly the first celebrity hairstylist. Now, was he a hairstylist to the nobility and to Louis XIV himself? No, men's men and did not. men and women had various. They were separate. It's a separate profession mm. to um, style hair. Louis XIV always wore wigs, so he had someone. Okay. He, they, we know his wig stylist. That's a separate <laughs> thing. He even had a wig room at Versailles, oh. on which he had stands keeping the hunting wig, the dressiest wig, the daytime wig. You know, I think there were sixteen of them. So that's another. Uh, thing and his his wig maker had a phrase I loved. He said he would strip every head of hair in France bare to keep <laughs> Louis's wigs in good order with the best hair. Because French uh -huh. they, they were sending hair cutters all over Europe to get just the right colors and the right quality of hair for these mm. wigs. Um, but no, but the stylists, women's hairstylists were particularly favored, and there were shops for the first time, shops where people could go in Paris to have their hair styled. And women wore a natural hairstyles. Depended. Yeah. They had, it was an incredibly complicated period. They had, we have invented nothing since then. <laughs> there were extensions, weave-ins, uh, bits of lace in the hair, incredibly complicated hair well, and saw, wigs as well. Some of them were so elaborate yes. and had uh, all kinds of things in yeah. them. I guess to a point that was perhaps unhealthy. Well, and also, once again, I think it's in the exaggeratedness of it that makes it, it's hard. Big hair periods tend to be the periods we then find hard to deal with afterwards. Mm. The minute, there's this sort of extension. It was a, 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 met, a wire base on which they attached fabric or lace. It was called a fontange for one of Louis XIV's mistresses who had allegedly invented the style. Mm -hmm. And that became, by the end of the century, just wild. Everyone in Europe was wearing them. And they were became huge, and they look a little bit freakish in portraits. So these were cages put on the head, and then the hair, hair was, put was de on de top. De decorated around okay. it. But it gives a sort of high effect to all hairdos by the end. But that was not that's there. That's in the 1680s on. Whereas the first hairstylist was doing one of the things he did that was very that shocked and scandalized was the idea of bobbing. It probably was just cutting a little bit. But yeah. women had never had their hair cut shorter as part of a fashion. And so that's a huge innovation and was taught much criticized. At first, people said they looked just 